Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Katie Rowley. I'm with the NOAA Central Library. Uh, I believe most people are teleworking today, so we thank you for joining us. We are excited to have our next installment of the NOAA Innovators Series. Uh, this this uh, presentation is being recorded, so if you miss it or would like to uh, extend it to a colleague later, it will be on the library's YouTube channel. If you can hold your questions until the end of the chat and place them into the questions panel, I will be reading those off for our speaker today, and they will all be recorded. If we do not get to your question, we will communicate that to the speaker, and they will reach out to you after the webinar is over. And with that, I will I would like to hand it over to Tiffany House. Thanks, Katie. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Tiffany House and I am the NOAA SBIR Commercialization Specialist. The NOAA SBIR program provides composition-based awards to small businesses for R&D to transform their innovative ideas into commercial products. All SBIR proposals must directly benefit the NOAA mission and have excellent commercial potential in order to be successful. R3 Digital Sciences started a phase two project with NOAA in 2017 to develop a device that converts existing fish traps to smart traps capable of targeting specific fish types. R3 Digital Sciences is pursuing opportunities to refine the fish trap extension kit for commercial sales. Brent Rader founded R3 Digital Sciences to create new solutions by transforming traditional devices into smart devices. He has more than 15 years of experience in developing and managing innovative engineering products. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Brent Rader. Oh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so uh, as Tiffany mentioned, uh, R3 Digital Sciences creates uh, intelligent devices and and uh, when we get a new problem uh, that we want to solve uh, our preferred method is to start with uh, a conventional device uh, and then add new features to solve whatever the unique problem is by integrating uh, intelligence into the device and convert it from a, a dumb device a conventional device into a smart device and we found that by developing products and solutions in that way uh, we are able to not only reduce the overall cost of the new product, uh, but also uh, reduce the learning curve to the user. And the fish trap extension kit that I'm going to talk about today is a really good example of this. So uh, lionfish, and there's a picture in the upper uh, right-hand corner of the slide, uh, are an invasive species. Uh, as you can see in the images in the uh, lower part of the slide, uh, over the past uh, 20 years, their population uh, in the southeastern United States has really exploded. In 1995, there were a few encountered off of the southern coast of Florida, uh, and in 2015, as you can see, they were in the Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean, and uh, all up and down the east coast. So NOAA was uh, looking for a way to catch uh, large numbers of lionfish, but to do so in an environmentally friendly way. And, and by that, they wanted a, a trapping solution that uh, would have uh, no bycatch and wasn't susceptible to what's called ghost fishing. So by no bycatch, what we mean is, is if we put out a trap and we were targeting lionfish, we would only catch lionfish. And by no ghost fishing, we mean if the trap gets lost, it won't continue to capture fish uh, while it's still uh, out in the ocean. And so my company was awarded a, a phase two, uh, which was followed by, a, sorry, a phase one, which was followed by a phase two SBIR to help develop a solution to this problem. And what we developed was the fish trap uh, extension kit. So uh, during our, our preliminary research, uh, prior to submitting a proposal, uh, we learned that uh, commercial spiny lobster fishermen uh, in, in South Florida, uh, primarily around the Keys, uh, some were catching tens of thousands of pounds of lionfish in their lobster traps as bycatch per year. And there are hundreds of thousands of these traps deployed commercially uh, in, in the Keys to catch spiny lobster. And so what we we uh, wanted to develop was a way to convert those uh, dumb conventional spiny lobster traps 
into a smart trap that would specifically target lionfish and only capture lionfish. And so to do that, we developed this FTEC, which uh, is a camera and actuated door system that uh, will discriminate between whatever has entered the funnel of the trap and if it's a lionfish, we'll open the trap door and allow the lionfish in. And if it's anything else, uh, it'll keep the door shut so they don't get in. In addition, if the trap gets lost, the door will, will remain shut uh, forever. Uh, and so the system we developed uh, can be deployed for two weeks at a time on rechargeable batteries uh, and to a depth of, of 300 feet. To develop the FTEC, as I mentioned, we were uh, awarded first a phase one and then a phase two SBIR. Uh, our original concept uh, is shown in the top picture, um, uh, and the phase one was to demonstrate that this concept was, was feasible. Our original concept uh, consisted of a couple of different fish detectors. Um, the, the primary fish detector was going to be a resistive sensing element that would uh, just detect when anything was in the presence of the trap. And that would cue the camera to take a picture and then the camera and image recognition would be used to discriminate between uh, just any old uh, target uh, fish and lionfish. And a solenoid actuator would be used to open and close the door as well as uh, lock it shut. And so the, the upper uh, picture in the slide shows uh, what our initial concept was. And phase one was to demonstrate its feasibility. Phase two uh, was to refine the design and uh, demonstrate an actual prototype working in an ocean environment. And so uh, during phase two, we developed what you see in the, the lower right hand picture and tested it uh, offshore. I also point out that we received some uh, additional funding from uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission to do some additional testing with the device. And that was in addition to what was provided by NOAA for this uh, SBIR program. So phase one was really about demonstrating the feasibility of that initial concept I showed. And in order to do that, uh, we instrumented a conventional fish trap with several types of sensors, uh, the ones that I had just mentioned. A, uh, resistive fish sensor. Uh, we included a IR uh, tripwire kind of sensor uh, as well uh, to experiment with. And then we put a video camera and uh, light LED illuminate or something so that we could see in the dark uh, on this trap. And we, we deployed it in uh, the Noah Beaufort's um, tank uh, there in uh, Beaufort, North Carolina, uh, and collected data of lionfish interacting with our sensors and the trap. And so the sequence of images here, and I'll show a video of this later, but um, the sequence of images here really shows uh, how we demonstrated that the concept in general was feasible. Um, the, in time, if you move from the upper left-hand corner to the lower right-hand corner, uh, you can see that uh, a lionfish is swimming around the trap, uh, examining the trap. Uh, in the lower left-hand corner, the, the trap door has opened and the lionfish enters uh, the trap, at which point the actuator's fired, uh, and that's not shown here, but you'll see it in the video, um, and, and captured the lionfish. And so uh, we were able to demonstrate the basic feasibility of a, a fish trap extension kit uh, in the uh, Noah Beaufort tank. And so the results of that uh, phase one led to an initial phase two com uh, concept for the FTEC that was uh, slightly different than, than what we'd initially proposed in phase one. Um, we determined because of the way that lionfish behave that we really didn't need any of these additional sensors. They move so slowly around the, track, uh, the trap that we didn't need uh, something to cue our imager uh, to start capturing images because um, you know, they move so slowly that we could just capture images periodically and we would we would be able to capture images of the lionfish and then or, or any other target and discriminate it from uh, the, the lionfish from things that we didn't want to catch. And but, so our phase two concept uh, is, is what's shown here. The camera was still on top uh, of the FTEC uh, we're still using a solenoid, or we propose to use a solenoid uh, to actuate 
the door. Um, and it would be uh, very similar to what we experimented with uh, in, in Beaufort's tank. So once we rewarded the phase two, our first step was to just verify that the results we'd seen in the Beaufort tank would translate uh, to an offshore environment. And so uh, we deployed our uh, data collection system uh, off the coast of Beaufort, North Carolina, where they have lionfish. And you can see a picture of it uh, positioned near a reef. This was about 30 miles uh, or so offshore. Um, and in the bottom pictures, you can see uh, a lionfish interacting with, with the trap. What this testing demonstrated to us was that the lionfish still move just as slowly and deliberately in the ocean environment as they did uh, in a tank in environment. Uh, and that was really key uh, because we wanted to use fewer sensors. It would reduce the cost and complexity of the system. And this confirmed that, that an imager alone uh, should be sufficient. So taking uh, what we learned from our offshore data collection, uh, we developed an initial phase two proof of concept prototype uh, of the FTEC. And, and you can see uh, pictures of it uh, on the slide. Uh, it consisted of primarily commercially available off the shelf components, including the enclosures that housed uh, the camera, the LED, uh, the batteries, uh, and so forth. Um, one custom component that we built for this test uh, was a new actuator. Uh, after uh, interacting with commercial fishermen and understanding how they use their traps and deploy their traps, we determined early on that having the camera on top of the trap was, was probably not going to work in a, a commercial setting because they stack their traps and in general um, are, you know, treat them pretty harshly. And so we wanted to protect those components by moving them inside the funnel itself. In addition, after experimenting with, uh, with image recognition and target detection algorithms, we recognized that we could simplify our uh, detection and, and uh, discrimination algorithms uh, by limiting the field of view to just what was inside the funnel. And so for this proof of concept prototype, we moved these, these COTS components uh, inside uh, of the funnel so that they were just looking in the funnel and we switched from a, uh, a solenoid to a custom actuator um, because the, the solenoid solution was simply not going to be uh, producible in large volume at low cost, whereas the actuator we ended up with uh, would be. So we uh, took our proof of concept prototype and uh, in uh, the spring of 2018 deployed uh, our FTEC trap along with 14 other non um, instrumented traps uh, off the coast of uh, Isla Morada, Florida, down the Keys. Uh, and so we were on the Atlantic side of the Keys. Uh, the 15 traps were deployed in about 160 feet of water. And we had a target detection algorithm uh, without any kind of discrimination. So all it would do was determine when something was in the funnel. And when something was in the funnel, it would capture an image uh, of it store that image, as well as uh, fire our actuator so that we could demonstrate that the actuator would work, our custom actuator would work at depth. And in the lower picture, you can see uh, we've detected a target and moved the actuator. And I've got a picture of it there uh, as it had moved about 45 degrees. A point out in our uh, 15 trap trawl, we caught uh, three lionfish, uh, and and then everything else was was bycatch. We didn't have a door on our FTEC, so um, that was not unexpected. Um, but what we were able to demonstrate with uh, this proof of concept testing was that uh, our actuator worked at depth, um, which was good, but also that we would need a wider field of view. As you can see, uh, the image of the lionfish in our picture uh, doesn't capture uh, the entire uh, lionfish. And although um, a human can discriminate that lionfish from something else, uh, it might be difficult to develop an algorithm to do so. And so we wanted a wider field of view uh, image. So we took the, what we had learned from there and we, we refined our uh, prototype design. Uh, we designed a fully custom uh, enclosure 
uh, a door that would uh, could be open and closed, uh, as well as the electronics, the printed circuit board um, that would uh, not only capture the images but run the image recognition algorithms and be in control of things like uh, the door. And you can see a model in the lower right-hand corner. As important, we we modeled the enclosure uh, using finite element analysis to demonstrate that the shape would work, uh, would not crush at the depths that we wanted to operate, which was up to, to 300 feet. So once we had our design, we, we actually um, constructed a refined prototype. We built a, a fully custom printed circuit board that had all of the uh, sensing uh, components on it. Um, it did not have the power supplies uh, on it. We housed those in a separate enclosure for this first uh, prototype. Uh, but we we manufactured a custom acrylic enclosure that would house the electronics, um, and it, we integrated all of this into a uh, a funnel that was uh, ready to test. Uh, the the batteries and the power supplies were housed in the same commercially available aluminum closures that we used in our earlier prototypes. So we took our refined prototype, and in December of 2018, we deployed it in a, a position similar to our, our previous testing, uh, again, on the Atlantic side off the coast of, of Isla Morada. This time we were about in uh, 140 feet of water. And again, we just enabled the target detection. We did not have lionfish discrimination turned on. However, uh, we did have a door and the door was actuated whenever a, a target uh, entered the funnel. The purpose in, in not doing discrimination at this point was really because we wanted to uh, exercise the door as much as possible, uh, as well as collect as much data as possible. And we didn't want uh, this discrimination algorithm getting in the way of that. Um, you know, with this 25 trap trawl, we caught three lionfish uh, and we caught uh, you know, 21 other kinds of things as bycatch. Uh, we did not catch anything in the FTEC enabled trap, um, and there's uh, probably a couple of reasons for this. Number one is that at some point during the deployment, our cable penetrator, the, the uh, mechanism by which the cable actually leaves the enclosure and connects to things like the actuator, and in this case, the batteries, um, that leaked. And so the, the device failed at some point during the trip. Um, and it also could have been that just nothing uh, entered the the trap funnel. Um, what the testing did, though, uh, tell us is that we needed to find a better way of of getting a cable out of the enclosure uh, that wouldn't leak. Um, but it also convinced us that it would be less risky to have a door that did not um, bisect the funnel. Um, we were concerned that perhaps this was causing uh, the fish. Uh, and specifically lionfish, not to enter the funnel. Uh, but it also had the capability of, of interfering with our image recognition algorithm. And so um, that led to our final FTEC prototype, which is shown here. Uh, it, it looks very similar to the previous prototype, except for the door is actually at the bottom of the funnel outside of the field of view completely of the camera. Um, in addition, all of the electronics, power supplies, and batteries uh, fit into this uh, custom enclosure. And in the final FTEC prototype, we, uh, we had lionfish discrimination. So not only would the FTEC detect when something was in the funnel, but it could discriminate it from uh, lionfish from things like spiny lobster or snapper or, or other fish. Uh, the the estimated uh, runtime of this uh, final prototype is is uh, two weeks, um, but it really depends on how many lionfish you caught. So we can run for two weeks um, if we catch ten lionfish. Uh, we see this as acceptable. The more lionfish we catch, the shorter our runtime will be. Uh, but if you catch you know twenty lionfish and only last a week, that's probably okay because you've still got a significant lionfish catch. Our estimated sales cost for our this final prototype that resulted from the phase two is about twenty five hundred dollars if if they're purchased in low quantity. Um, if we scale up and, and make them in high volume, we can sell them. Uh, we think between fifty and seventy five dollars. And this is just a, a picture of the 
the FTEC enabled funnel uh, actually just sitting on top of the trap. You can see the full battery compartment. Uh, that's there. There's a cap there that spins off, and you take that uh, that battery compartment off to go recharge the batteries and, and screw on another one. Uh, and you can actually see uh, the enclosure. I'm sorry, the actuator uh, here as well. So um, because we had not been encountering a lot of, of um, or catching a lot in our trap, we, we wanted to also obviously test uh, the discrimination and detection algorithm in the lab. Uh, and so we were able to show in our lab that uh, we could correctly discriminate uh, all non-lionfish. And by that, I mean if something was not a lionfish, for instance, if it was a spiny lobster or a snapper or something else, we correctly said that's not a lionfish. Um, the one, uh, the three cases where we have some difficulty are shown uh, with uh, the red boxes around them. Uh, and these are false negatives. And by that, I mean sometimes a lionfish will enter the trap funnel in such an orientation that the algorithm incorrectly says that's not a lionfish. Uh, and that's, if you look at these images, uh, the ones that are, have the red squares around them, even as a human, are, are somewhat difficult to tell our lionfish. And that's simply because when you look at the bottom of a lionfish or the top of it, um, it, it doesn't necessarily uh, have the unique shape of a lionfish, whereas all the other images do. And so in those cases, uh, our trap would not allow the door or would not open the door and allow the lionfish to enter. But again, uh, we see that as acceptable. Uh, we're still reducing bycatches, and, and in most cases, the lionfish is not going to enter in that orientation. We also, and I'll, I'll show a, I'll show an example of this, demonstrated uh, that this algorithm works uh, in uh, FWC's tank at their wet lab uh, in Marathon, Florida. Uh, so once we had, uh, you know, demonstrated that that our uh, detection demonstration or discrimination algorithm worked in the lab um, and the, the final prototype was ready, uh, we tested it uh, again in a similar location off the coast uh, on the Atlantic side of uh, Isla Mirada, Florida, and we did this uh, back in August. This time we were deployed between 135 and 140 feet and we were again, it was one uh, FTEC trap uh, amongst uh, a total of 25 traps in our trawl. This time we had the target detection and, and lionfish discrimination enabled. And again, uh, the trawl caught lionfish uh, and there was a significant amount of bycatch. Unfortunately, once again, uh, the FTEC had no catch uh, whatsoever. And so, um, you know, to summarize the development and testing of, of our FTEC, um, we, we expect that the FTEC actually encountered lionfish uh, during uh, its deployments, that, that final version especially, um, we expect encountered lionfish, um, but it didn't catch any, and so we obviously had concerns. And so we, we tested the, uh, the FTEC in a tank uh, at FWC's wet lab in Marathon. And you can see that in the picture here. And you can actually, if you look close, can see a, a lionfish there. And uh, the researchers from FWC that, that helped us and actually watched the trap uh, while it was at, in their uh, lab um, indicated that when lionfish entered the funnel, that the door would successfully open, except the lionfish tended to, in fact, always loitered in the, the funnel, even though the door was wide open and they could freely swim into the trap. And so this was different than what we saw uh, in phase one. And so uh, while it demonstrated that our algorithm worked, uh, it demonstrated that, that the way that the, the trap currently operates uh, typically didn't end in, in fact, in the lab or in the ocean, never ended with the lionfish swimming into the trap like they, uh, like they did in the tank at, at, at Beaufort. Um, and so uh, what we're going to do is add a pusher uh, to the uh, inside of the funnel that's attached to our actuation mechanism. It would be a very simple solution that when the door opens, uh, closes and pushes the, uh, the whatever is in the, the funnel uh, into the trap. And that should solve uh, this problem of having the lionfish loiter in the funnel even though the door is open. 
And so, although uh, the the solution was, you know, technically uh, can solve the problem, uh, we wanted to to also, you know, show that there's a uh, it, it's commercially viable. And so, um, in in talking with the commercial lobster fishermen in Florida, um, we devised a business model uh, for that would make this this solution, the FTEC, commercially viable. Um, but one you know, key assumption is that, uh, and one really uh, requirement for this business model, uh, is that there would be, there would need to be a lionfish fishery created. Uh, you know, down in the South Florida and the Florida Keys area that would allow low bycatch trapping of lionfish uh, during the off season when lobster fishermen cannot use their lobster traps. And so that's typically the uh, April to August time frame. Um, what, what we've, you know, what we've shown here is that, uh, you know, at the sales price, the wholesale price of lionfish, they were at about $5 a pound, and I haven't looked at it recently, but at $5 a pound, if we can sell uh, the FTEC unit for $50 to $75 per device, and if uh, the lobster fishermen deploy it 12 times over 120 days, so that'd be a 10-day soak time, uh, if they catch 1.25 pounds of lionfish in each trap that has the FTEC on it, that they the the device would pay for itself in one season, and and we've designed the device to work over over multiple seasons. So there there is a business model uh, that makes the FTEC uh, commercially viable, but it has this this uh, key requirement that there would be a a uh, reason to use, and that reason would be a lionfish fishery that allows lobster fishermen to use their traps during a time in the year when they currently are not using them and, the, and they're just uh, the traps are just set set on the side on shore and and essentially the fishermen are idle so where do we go from here um, we are currently pursuing opportunities and funding to add the this pusher that i mentioned to the ftec which would make it or should make it uh you know fully functional and anytime a lionfish enters the funnel uh, will push the lionfish into the trap. FWC, uh, the group we're working with out of uh, Marathon, uh, has expressed interest in purchasing the FTEX in low quantities so that they can experiment with them once the pusher concept has been demonstrated. They've, they've been helping us test the device and have seen the other components of it work, but recognize that it needs the pusher in, for it, in order for it to be effective. If in this new fishery I mentioned were to be created, we would pursue opportunities to scale up the FTEC for high volume manufacturing, because at that point, uh, it would make uh, commercial sense to do so. And then I think as important, we're actively commercializing other technologies that were developed under this project. Specifically, um, we are developing a lobster trap security system that uses the FTEC's sensing electronics, so the camera, uh, and other components. Um, there is a real problem in South Florida with uh, trap robbing. And so the law enforcement guys from FWC, as well as commercial fishermen, have asked if we could create something that would take pictures of people either pulling traps or uh, once they get them on the boat, opening the trap uh, and take their pictures so that they can be uh, prosecuted. And so we are actively developing that now uh, and it's going to be developed directly, from, it's being developed directly from the electronics uh, that came from the development of the FTEC. We're also considering developing a low-cost uh, temperature and depth sensor package, really a, a small data collector, low-cost data collector for fishing gear that uses the same electronics. Uh, we've seen that, that NOAA has, uh, has had uh, solicitations asking for similar things, but also the commercial fishermen uh, some do have an interest in being able to log what is going in and in and out of their their traps, uh, so they can improve how they fish for for things like spiny lobster. And finally, we're considering uh, adapting our uh, our custom actuator that is used to open and close the FTEX door uh, to be used as a robotic gripper uh, for you know submersible vehicles that go you know underwater. Uh, and so for both uh, the robotic gripper and the um, this low cost temperature and depth sensor, you know, we're, we're still evaluating uh, what the commercial appeal might be. The, um, 
the lo lobster trap security system is, is under development because there's a definite need and interest uh, for those commercially. I'd like to acknowledge a, a few organizations, two organizations and, and some people uh, for their assistance on this. Obviously, NOAA funded the bulk of this work and Steve Giddings was the, our, the technical monitor on the NOAA side and he helped us a great deal during both the phase one and phase two. Uh, the Division of Fisheries Management out of FWC uh, funded uh, additional testing of the FTEC and so we, we really appreciate that. Uh, and then uh, the guys at the South Florida Regional Lab uh, down a marathon continue to allow us to use their wet lab to test our uh, FTEC uh, in a tank essentially whenever we want to. And so I, I really appreciate uh, all of their assistance. So with that, I'll uh, open it up to questions and I'll just play a video in the background uh, from the tank at uh, Noah's Beaufort lab. Uh, and this was uh, the image sequence I showed earlier, but uh, while we're while I'm answering questions, you can watch the lionfish uh, go into a, a trap that has a door on it after the door opens, and then you can watch the the door get closed uh, and and capture him in the trap. Great, thank you so much, Brent. We do have a few questions, and the first one up is Steve Giddings. He was asking if you could say a bit more about what you currently think the pusher might look like. Uh, right now, uh, the, the concept we're working with would, would be a, uh, essentially another door, uh, but that um, is on the wall of the funnel. And so when the, uh, when the door opens, uh, it would go from being, uh, you can imagine a door, just like a door to a room. Uh, when the door uh, on the wall of the funnel uh, when the door opens to let the fish in, this pusher would essentially close another door. It's attached to it and force what's ever in the funnel into the, into the, uh, the trap. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from Ross Allen. Are you using deep learning algorithms for detection such as ResNet or DenseNet? No, so initially, uh, our initial concept, and I didn't get into this, actually um, was going to leverage uh, uh, an AI solution. In fact, we demonstrated the feasibility of it in phase one. However, um, uh, you know, a key component of these AI algorithms is, is training data. And because we, we lacked training data um, going into phase two and then throughout phase two because of our limited catch, uh, we moved to just a uh, an expert system, essentially. We, we It's a shape-based algorithm, but it's an expert system, not an artificially intelligent uh, solution for discriminating. Gotcha. Thank you. Our next question. Um, you refer to lionfish commercial fishery as perspective, yet Whole Foods and others indicate that they have difficulty obtaining enough supply to meet current demand. Isn't this sufficient evidence that there is adequate demand both for the device and for lionfish catch? So it's a it's a really complex issue um, and one that uh, I only understand at a basic level. But uh, lobster fishermen want to catch lobster, and uh, so the lobster fisherman I worked with, who who is was one of the leaders in lionfish catch, again as bycatch. Um, depending on the prices, of course, still prefers to catch lobster uh, and sell lobster um, because uh, he's got the ability to distribute it um, wholesale much better than, than to Whole Foods. Whole Foods, my understanding, was only buying from, was really only buying from a, a few different suppliers, um, although they, they, I think that they, um, maybe would, be, would consider buying from others. Uh, but during lobster season, which is the only time these traps are able to be used, the fishermen want to catch lobster, if at all possible. Uh, and then bycatch, which would include lionfish, is uh, kind of a nice to have, but not the way that they primarily generate revenue. And so um, that's really the challenge here, is, is that lobster fishermen want to catch lobster. These traps are and especially during lobster season are intended for that purpose. 
uh, it, when they catch bycatch, they sell that as well, but it's not their primary revenue generator. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have another question. Did you do any experiments with lionfish already inside the trap? Wouldn't they escape while the door is open? So the the experiments weren't designed around that, but I can tell you anecdotally that in the uh, in any tank where we've put this uh, a lobster trap, what I've seen is that once the lionfish move inside, they make it their home and they just hang out in there. Uh, they suck to the underside of the trap, they suck to the sides of it, and they just hang out inside the trap as if it was their you know their home. Uh, and don't tend the, the ones that I watched over you know a week in a tank. Once they went inside, they didn't want to leave. They just wanted to hang out inside. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other questions coming in. Uh, Tiffany, did you have anything you wanted to add? Oh. As I said, nothing that, from me. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, um, as, I, as I said this, a couple more questions popped up. Uh, so we'll roll with those. How is uh, ghost fishing addressed with this trap? So the, the trap is closed by default. Uh, the door is closed by default. In the phase one proof of concept, which it, it was actually open by default, but in the phase two prototype and the way we intend it to operate, it's closed by default. So if uh, the trap gets lost, the batteries die, the door doesn't open. And some of the testing we did uh, with um, with the FWC funding, as well as the NOAA funding, um, showed that at least over several days a week, that if the door is shut, and it, it, what holds it shut is a, a spring, um, that fish didn't get in. It's very difficult for them to push the door out of the way. And so it's addressed by just being a closed by default solution. When it fails because the batteries die, uh, it's got a door that won't open easily uh, because a, a spring keeps it shut. Great, following up on that, uh, Steve Giddings uh, wanted to know if you could say something about the new actuator and how it actually opens the door. Yeah, so it's uh, based on a what's called a memory-shaped alloy, um, but uh, basically it's a metal that uh, has memory, and um, you can uh, get it to change its shape by heating it up. And so uh, the gist of it is, is we use a heating element uh, to um, heat this memory-shaped metal up, and that causes it to uh, straighten. And when it straightens, uh, that that straightening is what's actually connected to the door uh, through a mechanical element, and that's what opens the door. And then what uh, that's what opens the door, yeah. Okay. And the thank spring you. returns the door to its closed position. Oh, okay. Uh, would you design differently for a trap specifically dedicated to catching lionfish as opposed to lionfish? as bycatch? Uh, I, I mean, I think it's fair to, yeah, to say that, that there's probably, in fact, everybody that I've worked with, even the guys that fish for lobsters, think that there is a, if there, that there's potentially a, a better way to design a, any trap to catch as much of anything that you want. And specifically, there are some things you could do to encourage lionfish catch. The reason that we um, designed it this way to use lobster traps, um, and the reason that we approach many problems in the, is, is in this way, and that's starting with an existing solution and adding intelligence, is that um, the custom traps, so the, the commercial fishermen uh, have all of the existing infrastructure on their boats now to deploy these traps. And so in order to deploy, traps in large numbers, uh, the only thing they need is the this different funnel. Whereas the custom custom traps, um, you know, they'd have to be designed specifically around, unless you want every fisherman to buy new gear to deploy them and retrieve them, and then to test that 
that these they're rugged enough to withstand all of that. Um, you know, you're asking for a significant investment by the commercial fishermen, and that was not based on our research something that was was feasible. That there was nobody, there was no commercial fishermen or anyone really that was willing to make the investment of all of the infrastructure necessary to fish a custom trap. And so we 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 used what they already are using uh, and just added this new capability to make it more environmentally friendly and specifically target lionfish. We thought that was the only real path to a, a commercially, commercially viable solution. Great, thank you. A next question, what kind of price supports and incentives could federal and state governments provide to improve your business model and return on investment? So, Certainly, so fishermen, and they're doing this in Florida, um, have been paid to help go out and especially test lionfish capture solutions. The FWC has been doing this. Uh, but fishermen are, so so fishermen who I think are the, going to be the primary, the primary users of, and, and the primary groups that are doing this in large numbers, um, assuming it's commercially viable um, are an interesting bunch in that um, like lobster fishermen if you offered them i in my experience if you offered them the equivalent of a day's catch in money to go fish for just lionfish many of them would probably still turn you down because they're lobster fishermen and they want to fish for lobster um, and i know that that doesn't it doesn't make sense to me but that's what my experience has been with them so I, but I will tell you is that during the off season um, and, and sort of the life in my experience of the guys that fish in South Florida, you know, they fish all year basically to pay their debts from the previous year when they're, when they're idle. That's sort of the fisherman's business model. And so they are always looking for additional revenue, it seems, during this off season when usually they're just sitting with their traps on shore, repairing some of their traps, but mostly not generating revenue. And so if there was a uh, if there was a financial incentive, that is, if somebody would pay fishermen during the off season to deploy their gear, let's say with an FTEC installed, I think, in fact, I know fishermen that would would be interested in doing that. But to do it during lobster season, I don't think is a, a viable means. I don't I think that they are going to want to go fish for lobster because that's what they do. Gotcha. Okay, we have one last uh, type of question going back to the pusher bar. Um, instead of a pusher bar, is it possible for the door to remain um, open at all times and the algorithm would uh, trigger the door to close for anything other than lionfish? It is, it is, and that's, that, that, that is certainly a possibility. Um, our, the design decision that we made um, was based on the idea that we wanted to trade catch performance with a super low um, bycatch um, and also eliminate the the need uh, to do anything and not and 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 prevent ghost fishing if the trap gets lost or something happens. And so, well, yes, I do think that um, an open by default solution could work. Um, and, and it's probably worth trying. Um, there will likely be a trade in terms of the amount of uh, not only bycatch, but also, um, you know, you're more susceptible to, to ghost fishing if something fails. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, we did have one last comment, not exactly a question, uh, saying that uh, Lobster Fisherman has invested a lot of time to develop those sales relationships and providing lobster sustains the relationships. So that could be another uh, reasoning for them not to want to use this during the lobster season. Yeah, I would I would totally agree. That sounds uh, a lot like what the, the guys that I've talked to uh, have said. Well, wonderful. I'm not seeing any more questions, but if you would like to put a question in the question panel, now would be the time. Um, these will all be recorded and we can pass them on later. And thank you, Brent, for putting up your information. And I want to thank everyone for coming.
we're going to give you back 15 minutes of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.